All right, today we come to the model church. This church represents the genuine church. This is the church that Jesus does not uh, need to rebuke. He doesn't need to correct. Uh, anytime you know, I hear somebody teaching through the book of Revelation and get the Church of Philadelphia, they always say, oh, this is our church. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, but you know, every one of these letters, he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there's things in each one of these letters that Jesus writes that we need to heed because none of us are perfect. There is no perfect church. If you're looking for it, uh, just by you showing up made it imperfect. So, sorry. I'm here, so it's not perfect. Anyway, um, this letter to the, the Church of Philadelphia, uh, he encourages them, he blesses them, uh, he commends them because they are doing church God's way. As we saw over the last couple of weeks, the last four churches that Jesus writes letters to, he brings up something about the last days. So these church systems are still around. Uh, they're still in, uh, you know, going through uh, church, churchianity, some of these. Uh, we saw that uh, he brings up the Great Tribulation. He brings up the Rapture. He brings up his second coming in these last four letters. Uh, we saw that the Church of Thyatira represents the Dark Ages because we saw every one of these letters um, represents a time frame in church history. Ephesus, desired ones, each name is very significant. Uh, he desired their love because even in the end of the first century, they were starting to drift away from that first love relationship. Church of Smyrna represents the persecuted church. 250 years, 6 million Christians were martyred for their faith. Smyrna gets its name from being crushed and ground up, and it produced myrrh, beautiful aroma, when it was crushed and ground up. Then we saw Pergamos, thoroughly married. Uh, that's when the church system became married to the world, to government. That is when uh, Constantine came into power. Then we had the Church of Thyatira, which represents the Dark Ages, the, the Catholic Church in some respects. Uh, you know, they had, it means perpetual sacrifice, and so picture Jesus on the cross at the Mass every week. That's where uh, Jesus has something significant to say to each one of these. Uh, Sardis means escaped ones the Reformation period. And, well, he tells Thyatira, unless you repent, you're going into the Great Tribulation. So that church system is still around. He says there's a few believers in that system, and we know Catholics that are believers, they love Jesus, and they're going up when the rapture happens. Whether they believe in the rapture or not, it doesn't matter if you believe in it or not. When it, the trumpet sounds, those in Christ will go up after those who are dead in Christ go up first. Be that as it may, the Church of Sardis means escaped ones, representing the, the Reformation period from about 1500. Jesus says, you have a name that you're alive, but I say you're dead. Because we saw how the church system, the Reformation, it sprung to life. They brought the Word of God back in the, the picture because the Catholic Church said it's illegal for anybody to read the Bible except for the priest. Now we have the Word of God, and during the Reformation, you know, faith alone and Christ alone became their motto, and it was a great time, a great movement. Millions of people get saved and changed, but then very quickly, he says, they drifted away. You have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. So they escaped ones. They came out of the Thyatira system, and then now we look at the last two, Philadelphia and Laodicea. They're kind of like branches on the tree, the Reformation, and then these kind of branched off. Philadelphia is a good branch, produces good fruit. Laodicea, a bad branch, producing bad fruit. Uh, Philadelphia means brotherly love, not brotherly shove, like the one in Pennsylvania. So um, that's the ideal church. Laodicea means rule of the people, and that's the last day's church where the people are telling God what to do and how to do it instead of the other way around. And so a lot of things he's going to be showing us as we go through these last two letters. Um, the Church of Philadelphia, again, it represents the last day's church. It sprung to life. If you put a time frame on it, probably around the 1700s, um, you might say when the Great Awakening took place, the Holy Spirit began to move in many people's lives. Uh, Germany and England, Scotland, Ireland, many of those guys came over here. And that was part of the Great Awakening during the 1700s, early 1800s. Great men of God rose up, Jonathan Edwards, um, uh, George Whitfield, the Wesley brothers. Uh, it just went down the line of these great, you know, Charles Finney. 
uh, guys like D.L. Moody towards the end of the 1800s, early 1900s, Billy Sunday. Some even put Billy Graham in this category where the word of God was going forth. People are returning to the Bible. People are getting excited about Jesus and sharing the gospel with those around them. And that's what we see here with the Church of Philadelphia. God opened up great doors at this time for missionary work. This is when uh, guys like Hudson Taylor go to China. Uh, guys like uh, David Livingston goes to uh, Africa. Guys like William Carey goes to India. And millions of people were coming to Christ. And they had this renewed passion for Jesus, the word of God, for evangelism. In other words, this was a time when the church was returning to its roots by proclaiming Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Faith in, in Christ. You need to come to Christ. He paid the price for your sins. He did everything for you by hanging on the cross, taking the wrath we deserve upon himself. He paid that price, shedding his blood, the only acceptable payment for our sins. He rose from the dead, and because he's alive, he alone can offer the free gift of eternal life to anyone who will put their faith and trust in him alone. And as we'll see in this letter, that is still one of the chief characteristics of this church system that we're looking at with Philadelphia. It was also during this time that many Christians started to recapture the blessed hope. They're watching and ready, and they're looking with anticipation for Jesus Christ, for the return of the Lord, for the rapture of the church. Some people today try and say that the doctrine of the rapture was invented by J.N. Darby in 1830, but that is simply not true because we'll see this morning that many scriptures in the New Testament speak of the rapture of the church before the Great Tribulation. Uh, we'll look at these verses here in a moment. The bottom line with the Church of Philadelphia and this kind of church system is that it's a gathering of people who love Jesus. They have a, a genuine relationship with the Lord. They love God's Word because they believe this is God's revelation. This reveals God's nature, His character, His plans and purposes for our lives, for the people in this world. And, and this is how He has communicated Himself to us and this is why we take the Word of God very seriously. His Word leads us to Christ. His Word builds us up. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And He's preparing our hearts for eternity. That's why He commends them for what they do, holding fast to the Word of God. So let's quickly look at this letter to the Church of Philadelphia, beginning chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. And again, for those that haven't been here, the word angel, angelos, means messenger. He's probably writing these because Jesus doesn't need to write letters to angels. <laughs> they stand before the Lord. And so he's writing this probably to the pastors of these churches, to the leaders there. And so the angelos, John the Baptist is called an angelos, the messenger for Christ. So he's writing this letter to the church in Philadelphia. He says, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. Again, only two letters, two churches are not rebuked. They're not corrected. Smyrna, the persecuted church, and this church here in Philadelphia. Here he's affirming to them who he is, who they are because they are new creations in Christ. So the first thing he says here is, I who am holy. Jesus Christ is holy. That should be obvious. He reminds them that he is pure. He is sinless. Holiness means to be set apart for God's exclusive purposes. And Jesus is the ultimate example of being set apart for God's exclusive purposes. There's nobody just like Jesus. As the Son of God and God the Son, there's no one like Him. He is holy, means He's in a class by Himself. He is different. But at the same time, because we are in Christ, He calls us to live holy lives. He wants us to be different from the world. He wants our lives to be used for His exclusive purposes. Um, you're familiar with Romans 8, 29. It's the verse on predestination. But he says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we might be the firstborn among many brethren. And so that's God's goal 
through this whole process is to conform us to the image of his son, Jesus. So holiness is a good thing. Unfortunately, Christians today look at holiness to mean, you know, God is going to turn us into a bunch of religious weirdos. Or they look at holiness as being, you know, you think you're better than me. That's not what it's all about. Holiness means to be set apart from a sinful world, but it also means to be set apart to the Lord Jesus Christ in a genuine relationship with Him. That combination of being set apart from and being set apart to, that's really life-changing. When you understand this, then that's changing your heart. It changes the way you look at the world around you. And as you know, holiness is both an event that took place at the moment of salvation, but it's also a process that we go through in our lives. Again, at the very moment you receive Christ, He set you apart. He made you holy. Uh, he declared you righteous. That's our standing with Jesus. He declared you righteous. That's our position because we are in Christ. But also when we believed in Christ and we got saved, we entered into a lifetime process as well. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says we're going from glory to greater glory. So we're in this process. He started the work in us. He will complete the work he started. So the Holy Spirit from the inside out takes us from where we you know, know this is positionally true. I'm righteous. I'm holy in Christ. And he works it into and out of our daily lives. Again, we're living in a time when many people look at holiness as being stuffy or boring but that's not true. Holiness is very, very attractive. How do I know that? Because Jesus is the most holy person ever to walk this earth. And he was very, very attractive. He had masses of people following him. Uh, ladies, you guys are starting Hebrews. You just start, had Hebrews chapter 1 this past week. Hebrews 1.9 says of Jesus, You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. That's a good definition of holiness. You love righteousness, you hate lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. In other words, nobody is more holy than Jesus. Yet Jesus radiated more joy and gladness than anybody. So, he who is holy. And then the second thing in verse 7, it says, He who is true. Literal translation means Jesus is saying, I am the true or I am the genuine one. In other words, he is the only true Messiah. He is the only genuine Savior. Everything about Jesus is true. Everything Jesus says is the truth. And this is what Jesus meant when he's talking to Philip, you know, in um, John 14. And Philip says, show us the Father and that'll be enough. That'll be sufficient. And he says, have I been with so long with you, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So Jesus is the perfect, exact representation of the Father. Now, over the last 2,000 years, Satan has done all that he can to distort the truth about Jesus. Satan has inspired many false prophets, many false teachers to change the true nature, the genuine character of Jesus Christ. I mean, you look at any cult out there, any aberrant teaching around us, and they always change Jesus. There's always different versions of who Jesus is. He cannot save your soul, their version of Jesus. He cannot wash your sins away, their version of Jesus. He's not the spirit brother of Lucifer, and we're all spirit brothers with Jesus. That's not true. He's not a created being like the JW say. He's not Michael the archangel in the Old Testament. He is and always has been God the Son co-equal, co-eternal with the Father and the Holy Spirit. But the nature and character of Christ is always changed by the cults. And their version, he cannot save you. He cannot give you eternal life. And they're very clear about this. You have to work your way to heaven. You have to do all these different things to earn your salvation. Jesus did so much for you, but it's up to you to do the rest. That's nonsense. The biblical Jesus can save you, he can heal you, he can give you everlasting life because the Bible alone is where we find the true and genuine Jesus. So take note of that. He is the genuine one, the true one. Then he says in verse 7, He has the key of David. 
And so when he opens a door, nobody can shut it. When he shuts a door, no one can open it. And the key of David means he has all authority. The key represents authority. So he has all authority to do what he's going to do. He is sovereign. He is God come in human flesh. So he alone has the authority to save. He alone has the authority to forgive. Not some priest, not some pope, not some pastor. Only Jesus Christ can forgive you of all of your sins and give you the free gift of eternal life. In Christ alone, we find that he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So we don't need to go around looking and searching for, and I'm sure we all have books, you know, the key to victory. You know, the key to happiness. The key to, you know, you can put in, fill in the blank. The key to all these different things. No, Jesus has the key to all that we need for life, for godliness. He's given us all that we need for life and godliness. In fact, Jesus is the key to everything we need. When Jesus gives the disciples the Great Commission, this is him giving the key of the kingdom, the gospel to them. When he says in Matthew 28, you're familiar with these verses, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he is the key. So he tells the disciples, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. The only way we can be effective in proclaiming the gospel of Christ is go through the open doors that he opens, unlocks before us. If you try to go through doors, which I have, I'm sure all of us say, well, I'm going to go through that door, and it's locked, and so you're beating your head against it, trying to open it. It's a waste of effort, a waste of time, a waste of resources. Go through the doors the Lord opens before you. So look at verse 8. Jesus says, I know your works. Again, he says that to every church, which is good. He knows your works, or it's a little scary. <laughs> he knows what you're doing. He sees all. He's omniscient. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So again, first of all, Jesus says, I've set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Whenever you read of doors in the New Testament, it's always opening up a door for the gospel. It's opening up a door for the word of God. We see this over and over again. First and foremost, Jesus is the door. He's the door of salvation. John chapter 10, verse 9, Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. So Jesus is the only entrance door into heaven. In Acts chapter 14, verse 27, it says, Now when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them, and that he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And so the word of the Lord went forth when God opens the door. And, and so we look for open doors. And we'll see. Yeah. Open doors to India. I mean, we're, we're in Northeast India. We're in Africa with Go Give Hope. And God has opened up doors there. I mean, it's been awesome. I mean, literally, last year, I don't even know the numbers this year, but last year, 3,000 uh, souls were saved. 300 church, or 200, was it 200 or 300? Emily, I'm talking to you. 300, okay. 300, I don't speak Hindi or seven other languages that he speaks. 300 home churches were planted just last year. I mean, that's an open door. God is using our church planters, and they're just going for it. And every, there's 50 of them we support, and you guys are a blessing because you're supporting them, and it's getting the word of God out, and they're going through these open doors. Uh, Paul says something similar. Well, in Ephesians, he says this, and then also here in Colossians 4, verse 3, Paul is saying, Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I also uh, I am also in chains. 
And so the Philadelphia believers were engaged in the Great Commission. They were sharing the faith. They were proclaiming the good news of Jesus with others. Part of the motivation behind this is we must never forget how miserable, I don't forget how miserable I was before I got saved. That should motivate you to see others who are in the condition you were in before you got saved and realize, man, if God can save somebody like me, total idiot in San Diego State, blowing it big time, and, and, and he saved me and changed me and delivered me, then we need to see others the way he sees us, or he saw us before we got saved. He, he had love, compassion, grace, and mercy. I know what I deserve. He could have just like, you're done. Flick me out, you know, like a little mosquito, or swat me down, and you're done. I'm done with you. No, he loves us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So we, we realize how lost we were before Jesus saved us and washed all of our sins away. And so we want to be faithful to the Lord to share the good news of Jesus with those in our community, in this area. You know, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he you know, gave them the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be witness to me in Judea, or Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the end of the earth. So our Jerusalem is Grand Junction, or if you live in Fruta, whatever. Um, that's your Jerusalem. And then Judea, Colorado, you know, Samaria, the United States, <laughs> a bunch of half-breeds we are. And then to the other uttermost parts of the earth. He wants us to go forth with open doors he sets before us and share the good news. Now, even though much of America has been saturated with the gospel, I don't want to offend anybody, but God keeps bringing people in from our southern border. And some of you that are politically minded say, oh, it's got to close. Well, that's okay. It can close. That's fine. But look at it as an opportunity. God's got the border open to bring people in because they need to hear Jesus. They need to hear about Christ. They need the forgiveness. So there's a balance there. You know, it was funny because back in the 70s, when it seemed like most of Southeast Asia was moving to Southern California, because I was there, and then I got saved in 77, and then, you know, before I got saved, it was like, why are all these people here? They're taking up my favorite beach spot. I want to go surfing here. There's all these foreigners here surfing. They don't even know how to surf. You know, you get all this attitude. And then I get saved, and then Ch Pastor Chuck would say, you know what, we can't get to Vietnam or Laos or Cambodia and all these different countries over there. God brought them all here. And when you looked at their bulletin, they had almost 100 home fellowships, and most of them were all these foreign countries. And they were getting saved by the thousands. It was amazing because God loves everybody. So whether they come in here illegally or they come here legally, it doesn't matter. In God's eyes, he loves them. And he wants to save them. So don't look at them as like, oh, man, they're ruining everything. No, they need to hear about Jesus Christ. Um, you know, we get refugees coming. Uh, some are coming from Ukraine. And I'm trying to think, where's the country they were trying to get? Afghanistan. Yeah. And, you know, that's great. Uh, one of the churches that was trying to take this on was said, you can't tell them about Jesus. I was like, why? Wait a minute. That's the whole purpose. We're not here just to make their life more American. We want to see them have a heavenly kingdom. We want to see them part of the kingdom of God and glory. That's what it's all about. So Jesus opens up doors. And we need to be faithful to go through those open doors. And so Jesus commends our church for going through these open doors. Like I mentioned, with Africa, Go Give Hope, especially in Northeast India. And at the same time, there's a lot of people who are listening to our messages online, who are listening to, you know, things on our website and podcasts and other techie things that I don't understand. But praise the Lord, we got guys like Bill Gordon and Stanley Prescott that do understand that stuff, and they're on top of it. So whatever God wants to do, that's great. The last half of verse 8, look at this again. He says, I've said before you an open door, no one can shut it. And here's the reason why. And he gives us three reasons why. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So number one, for you have little strength. The, word, the key word there is little. They have little strength. 
Um, they weren't a big mega church. Even the Church of Philadelphia back, you know, 2,000 years ago, it was a small church, fairly insignificant as far as world standards are concerned. But here he says you have little strength. The word strength there is dunamis. We often translate it power. Holy Spirit will come upon you and he'll give you power to do these things God calls you to do, be a witness for Christ. So their power was fairly small. You have little strength. Jesus is being very honest with them. They, they don't have lots of power. and But what they did have was because they were depending on the Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus commends them for because they're not going around boasting and bragging, we're this big, powerful mega church, and we've got a thousand programs, and we're doing this, and we got lots of money, and we had this big building. It's you know, no. Jesus is complimenting them here. Like the Apostle Paul, they could say, When we are weak, then we are strong, because it's in the strength of the Lord. Not in their power, but it's in the Lord's strength. This means they were humble, they weren't boasting and bragging. God is famous for doing a lot with very little. Just think of Gideon. Gideon was very fearful. He's one of the judges of Israel. He didn't want to be a leader. He was hiding. He was afraid of the Midianites. And then God called him. You know the story. And he puts the fleece out. And, and God says, no, you're the one I'm calling. And long story short, the Midianites had 135,000 warriors. are going to come against them. God trims their group down to 300 Israelites. 300 against 135,000. Guess who won? God can do tremendous things through very little. There's an old saying, God and me makes a majority. That's true. When God is on your side, when he opens doors, no one can shut it. If you're willing and humble before the Lord, he can do above and beyond all that we could hope or imagine. So he commends them for their little strength, and then he commends them for, and why he's opened up the door to them. Notice the second thing, you have kept my word. The word kept means to preserve, it means to guard and protect from damage or loss. So they kept the word of God. In other words, they took the Bible very seriously. They didn't add to it, they didn't take away from it, but they believed it and they received it as the word of God. So they protected the word from being damaged. Unfortunately, we don't see this in many churches today, many denominations, and unfortunately, many seminaries are now saying, well, the Bible is not inerrant. In other words, they think there's mistakes in the Bible and they try to come up with all these reasons why and they just water it down. They come against the word of God or they say, well, it doesn't really mean what it says here. Uh, I threw out that statistic a few weeks or a few months ago now, but Barna did that study and 37% of all senior pastors in America, only 37% believe in a biblical worldview. That means 63%, if my math is right, I wasn't very good at math, I think that's right. 63% of American pastors, senior pastors, do not believe this is the inerrant word of God. So why are they in the pulpit? Just go teach Mother Goose rhymes, you know? It's just ridiculous. So we are in a lot of trouble in our nation. C.S. Lewis, this is a great quote. He said, if you don't study the Bible and believe it, it doesn't mean you will have no ideas about God. It just means you'll have a lot of wrong ones. That's true. If you don't study the Bible and believe it, it doesn't mean you'll have no ideas about God. It just means you'll have a lot of wrong ones. But Jesus commends the little church here in Philadelphia because they kept his word. That means they guarded it. That means they cherished the word of God. They believed this was the word of God. They held on tight to the promises of God's word. It was living. It was powerful. Um, sharper than any two-edged sword. In other words, the Bible was real to them, and they knew this was God's word of truth that effectively works in us and changes us. This is what Paul says to another baby church. Remember, he was in Thessalonica for three weeks, and then he gets run out of town, and he writes a letter back to them, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul says to that little church, for this reason... We also thank God without ceasing because when you received the word of God, 
which you heard from us, you welcomed it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. And so Jesus commends these types of churches. And let me commend you as well. Uh, I like this about you guys also. You love God. You love God's word. You are holding fast to the promises of God's word. And that goes from our Sunday school teachers to our youth groups, um, to our life groups, um, just, you know, the worship team, our men's and women's Bible studies. You know, I, I love the fact that we're not caving in to the pressures of the culture around us. We're not going to become woke and we're not going to start compromising here and there. And pretty soon you see this in so many churches like the Church of Sardis started off on fire and then they start compromising here and there. And then pretty soon anything goes, everything goes. Whatever you want to believe is right in your own eyes. And you're back where Israel was when God judged them. But we're standing on the truth of God's word. We're standing on the Bible. We're saying God says what he means and he means what he says. People get offended a lot when I teach and it's like, I don't care. <laughs> I'm not going to answer to you. If I'm teaching God's word, rightly dividing the word of truth, I have to answer to God. That's why James 3.1 says, let there not be many teachers among you. You will receive the stricter judgment. And I take that very seriously because I'm going to stand before God and have to give an account for what I do and what I say. So when people say, well, I don't like you, so you offended this person. It's like, eh. The Holy Spirit may have offended them. I'm just saying what God's Word says. If that offends you, then take it up with God. That's the issue. So we know that only Jesus can satisfy a thirsty soul. And the, the way He speaks to us and, and, and He reveals Himself to us, it's through His Word. So again, He's opened this door because they have little strength. They've kept His Word. Then notice the third thing He mentions here. They have not denied my name. That's why he's opened up the door, because they have not denied the name of Jesus. That literally means to not deny who and all that Jesus is. Name reveals nature. Name reveals character. Jesus is saying to this church, you're not the kind of church that believes that, you know, I am some false teaching. You believe I am the Son of God. I am God come in human flesh. You believe I am the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And though the pagan world around us and the pagan world around the Church of Philadelphia at that time was putting pressure on them to deny the Lord, reject God's Word, go with the culture around you. Nothing new under the sun. We have our culture trying to say you need to be more like the world. Well, they were doing the same thing back then and under the Roman authorities, the Roman Empire was saying, you got to worship Caesar or else. And that's why so many Christians were put to death in the first couple centuries because they would not worship Caesar. But we say we belong to Jesus Christ. We're not going to deny who he is. We're going to stand strong in both God's word and how we live our lives. We're going to reflect his nature, his character. That's not denying his name. So Jesus is saying to them, your testimony is making a difference. By the way, your testimony is making a difference. Your testimony is important. And I've said it for years, we're either a good witness and have a good testimony or we're a bad witness as Christians and have a bad testimony. It depends on how you're living your life. Are you living it for Jesus or are you living it for the things of this world that are passing away? Don't ever think that your life doesn't matter. Whether you realize it or not, people are listening to you. They are watching you. In some respects, we're all missionaries. He's, he calls all of us to be light and salt. You know, who knows when we get to heaven and we see somebody and they come up to us like, oh man, thank you for sharing Jesus with me. When did I, I don't even know, who are you? Well, I was in the grocery store and you were talking about Jesus to the cashier and I was right behind you. And it's like, who knows what your witness will do? And who you're going to touch just by being a godly example to those around you. So don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Christ because we have no idea how many people will be in heaven just because we were faithful witnesses for Christ. 
you know, one of the things I look forward to is meeting all the, um, well, I get to see them when I go to India, the missionaries, our church planters, but all the people that they've led to Christ, all these former Muslims, all these tribal groups, many Hindi, Hindus, it's amazing. And man, what a blessing. Just that extended family, just because we're faithful to do, do what God's called us to do, go through those doors he opens. Look at verse 9. This is one of those difficult verses where he says, Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan, who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet, and to know that I have loved you. Now, this is the second time that Jesus mentions the synagogue of Satan, and he says there are Jews who are not really Jews, Again, Jesus is referring to those who reject him as their Messiah. These were the Jews who claimed Jesus was doing his miraculous ministry by the power of Beelzebub. And Jesus says, you're this close to blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, that's the unpardonable sin. Jesus told those same Jewish leaders, you are of your father, the devil. That would be part of the synagogue of Satan. The Apostle Paul, when he was still Saul of Tarsus, was of the synagogue of Satan because he was going around destroying Christians. He had some arrested. Paul even says that he had some put to death, and yet he got saved. And so we pray for our Jewish brethren, not brothers and sisters in Christ yet, but we're seeing many Jews come to faith in Christ in these last days. We need to keep praying because we know they're going to go through the great tribulation, but at the end, we're going to see this as we go through Revelation. When Jesus returns, every Jew that survives the great tribulation, which is one-third of all the Jews on the planet, and we'll see why, um, they do turn to Christ and they get saved. And Romans 11.25 says, All Israel will be saved at the second coming of Christ. So a day is coming when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11. For many people, it's going to be too late because you can either bow down now and acknowledge Him as Lord and Savior, or at the great white throne, people will be forced to bow down and acknowledge that He is Lord, and they'll be cast into the lake of fire. Philippians 2.10 says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, Hopefully that's all of us, and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, the unsaved, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. But Jesus here is referring to those who strongly opposed the gospel of Christ, who stirred up the Roman government to come against Christians, and a day is coming when all the unsaved will bow before Christ. Even though the world hates us, Look at the last thing he says there in verse 9, that they're going to know that I have loved you. Isn't that amazing? I can't really picture that. I don't understand how that all plays out. But we're going to be as the bride of Christ with Jesus, and all the unbelievers at the great white throne will be there. And they're going to realize that he has loved us, that I have loved you. How glorious is that? It'll be too late for many. Well, look at verse 10. Come to some exciting things here. Because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, that no one may take your crown. Now, this is a great promise from Jesus to his church, his bride. He's saying, because you have kept my word, you've not denied my name, you've endured the hardships of this life, I will keep you from, this is the great tribulation that he's referring to. I'll keep you from it. The word Jesus uses for kept and keep here is the same Greek word. It's tireo. It means I have kept you, I have guarded you, I will protect you from danger or loss. So think of that. How do we know Jesus is referring to the great tribulation here? Because he calls it the hour of trial. That means it's a specific time frame in world history. 
That's what chapter 6 through 18 in Revelation is all about. The hour of trial, the great tribulation. He says, the hour of trial which shall come upon the whole world. In other words, it's not a local event. It's not a little trial or tribulation over here. It's, and he says, to test those who dwell on the earth. That phrase, to test those who dwell on the earth, is used eight times in Revelation. Every time it refers to the great tribulation, the time of God's wrath. That's the great tribulation. He's going to keep you from the great tribulation. That's what he's promising here. Now, Jesus did not say that he would keep us and preserve us as we go through it, but he would keep us from it. The word from here literally means out from among. E-K is the Greek word, and it means he takes you out from among the great trial that is coming on this whole world to test the whole world. We will be removed out from among the earth before God pours out his wrath upon this Christ-rejecting world. And by the way, that's the pattern we see throughout the Bible. God removed Enoch before the flood. God removed Lot before he poured out his wrath upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Second Peter 2.9 says, Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. There are many scriptures that give us God's assurance that we will not go through the great tribulation. Again, great tribulation equals God's wrath. Don't mistake that. It's very important. So we have verses like this, Romans 5, 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. 1 Thessalonians 1.10 uh, Paul, first of all, commends them because they turned to God, uh, turned to God from idols to serve the living God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he delivered from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from, out from among, that's ek, the wrath to come. That's a good promise. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, that's the great tribulation, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how are we removed from earth before God's wrath is poured out? By the rapture. Jesus comes for his bride before the great tribulation, and he snatches us out of here instantly. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52, it's not on the screen, but that's where he says, I tell you a mystery, you know, we're not all going to sleep or die, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. This mortal will put on immortality, this corrupt will put on incorruption, but that fast, we're changed. This one you're familiar with, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, Paul also says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So all those who have died as believers in Christ over the last 2,000 years, they're going to be caught up first, to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. People always want to know, well, what happens when I die? Well, your spirit goes up to be with the Lord. Your body goes in the ground. It dissolves, whatever. But at the rapture, the dead in Christ rise first. That's when they receive their resurrection bodies. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Now, I find it sad that there are so many Christians who are bugged or they become upset by the teaching of the rapture, and they'll say things like, well, believers have always had to go through trials and persecutions and hard times in this world, so why should we be the last generation of Christians to escape these things? Why are we, this last generation, the only ones who escape that? Then they get upset by this. It's really backwards if you think about it. After all, the great tribulation or the time of God's wrath has never been poured out on the church. The history of the church from Pentecost to the rapture, there's never been God's wrath poured out on this world. Never. So that means that there has never been a generation in church history where Christians have gone through the great tribulation. So you reverse and say, so why should all previous generations of Christians escape the great tribulation and this last one is the only one to go through it? Doesn't make any sense either. 
you understand what the Great Tribulation is. It's, again, God's wrath poured out upon a Christ-rejecting world. Jesus said, in this world you'll have trials, tribulations, persecutions, but take courage, I've overcome the world, because what we face, what the church has faced for 2,000 years, it's never been God's wrath. It's always been judgment, not judgment. It's always been the attack of the enemy, the attack of the world that come against believers. The devil has come against believers, but the Bible is clear. Jesus on the cross took all of God's wrath, all of his, you know, the punishment that I deserve. Jesus hanging on the, why did he cry out? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that moment, the wrath of God that we deserve for our sins was put upon Jesus in our place. He took what we deserve upon himself. And so when people say, you know, I don't want Jesus, I don't need Jesus, well, then you will have to face God's wrath. For us in Christ, Jesus already took the wrath in our place. That's why uh, Hebrews 13.8, I believe, no, 13.5, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you, because on the cross Jesus said, why have you forsaken me? Because the Father forsook him, but now we're not forsaken because we are in Christ. Jesus paid the price for our sins fully and completely. And so the wrath of God that I deserve, that you deserve, was paid in full by Jesus. So 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him, the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Again, on the cross, he took the judgment, the wrath for sin that we deserve. He became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God is not going to burn, beat up, set demons on his bride before the wedding feast. Isaiah 53, verse 6, another verse you're familiar with. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him, on Jesus, the iniquity of us all. Again, he paid the price fully and completely when he hung on the cross for us. Look at verse 12 and 13. We'll wrap it up here. He says, he who overcomes, and that's what he says to every one of these churches. There's always a promise to those who overcome. I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So he gives them and us three wonderful promises. Three times he says, I will. First he says, I'll make him or I'll make you a pillar in the temple of my God. So Philadelphia instantly knew what Jesus was talking about. In 17 AD, there was a massive earthquake that leveled Philadelphia, and that's present-day Turkey. They still get a lot of earthquakes. It leveled a lot of these cities that we're reading about in chapters 2 and 3. But in Philadelphia, it leveled the city. The only thing left standing were these massive pillars. That's the only thing that was left standing. Here Jesus is telling them, no matter how shaky or troubled this world becomes, you will always find stability in me. When all is said and done, you're going to stand like a pillar because no earthquake, spiritually speaking, can destroy you. Twice Jesus says, I will write on you the name of my God. I will write on you my new name. In biblical times, when somebody wrote their name on something, it meant ownership. So God is simply saying, Jesus is saying, I've written my name on you. You belong to me. We belong to the Lord. We're new creations in Christ. He purchased us from the slave market of sin. He says, you're not your own. You were bought with a price, and that was the blood of Jesus. That means nothing can separate us from his love for us. And all Jesus wants us to do as we see this letter is to hold fast, hold on tight to Jesus, hold fast to his word, keep your eyes on eternal things as you look around the world and see people in need. Hang on tight to the blessed hope of seeing Christ in a moment in the twinkling of an eye to a Philadelphia Christian and to be like what Jesus is saying here means to love Jesus, love his word, 
love sinners enough to let them know Jesus loves them and he died for them. And then to bless your brothers and sisters, love your brethren, and to eagerly wait for Christ to come. That's what makes life full. That's what gives us joy. That gives us meaning and purpose to the life God has given us. And then when our time is up, whenever that might be, and it can be today at the rapture, tomorrow, it could be whatever knocks us down and takes us home. We don't know. But whenever that happens, we're going to stand in his presence and see Jesus Christ face to face. You know what he's doing right now? He's preparing a place for you. Let me close with these verses. John chapter 14, starting in verse 1. You know, this is appropriate for our time frame in which we live. Let not your heart be troubled. Elections are coming a less than a month away. <laughs> Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions or dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. That's what he's doing right now. He's preparing a place for you. He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. So that's the first mention of the rapture in the New Testament. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. I can hardly wait. And in the meantime, let's be about the Father's business. Whatever door he opens for you, go through it with joy and gladness. Don't be a sourpuss Christian. Because I remember before I got saved, I could always tell if that Christian that was witnessing to me really was concerned about my soul or if they just wanted to get another notch in their belt. I mean, I could read right through them. And I, and, I, and I even told some, you don't even care about me. You're just, you've got a quota of people you told God, I'm going to witness to 10 people today and I'm number 10 and you can't wait to get this done. I mean, I'd tell them. So I'm not going to take whatever you, just leave. I mean, I'd cuss them out. I did all this stupid stuff. I wasn't a believer, you know, and then, but you realize those who really, and I can still remember their faces. I don't know their names, but I can still remember those that truly love me were concerned about my eternal soul, and I could I knew those people, they they love me for some reason. I don't know why. And they're telling me about this Jesus guy that I didn't like because he's going to cramp my style. But, man, when I hit bottom and I got kicked off the team and I had all my pity party thing, then God was there. And Jesus revealed himself in, in a powerful way. And, you know, you never turn back. You never look back. You just realize, God, you are so good. To love someone like me. Let's 